Uh, and now I'd like to welcome back Senator Penny Wong, the Honourable Penny Wong, who's been a great supporter of this conference over the years. Uh, senator Wong has been a senator for South Australia since 2002. In 2007, she was appointed to the position of Minister for Climate Change and Water, which later also included energy efficiency. In 2010, she was appointed Minister of Finance and Deregulation. Since 2013, she's been Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. She's also the subject of a recently released biography, Penny Wong, Passion and Principle by Bar Margaret Simons, which I look forward to reading. Welcome, Sen Pe uh, Senator Wong. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zara, for the introduction and for your service to the Institute over many years. May I begin by acknowledging that we are meeting today on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I acknowledge uh, in, I think he's now left, Alex Hawke, my parliamentary colleague, to Alan Gingell, uh, to members of the Diplomatic Corps and to people passionate about foreign policy. Thank you very much for coming uh, to the conference and, and for the invitation to, for me to speak again. So today I want to talk about Australia's relationship with China, but more broadly the approach to foreign policy that I urge upon the federal government. Australia's relationship with China is complex and it is consequential. It, China is and will continue to be of great importance to, us, to our region, to Australia and to the world. The key question for Australia is how we best make the relationship work for us. How do we make it work knowing that China will always press for what's best for it, just as we should always press what's best for us? How do we make it work in the context of strategic competition between our friend and ally, the United States, and our important partner, China? How do we make it work recognising that challenges may intensify and become harder to manage in the future? Fundamentally, we are in a new phase in this relationship. It isn't simply a matter of a diplomatic reset, nor a reversion to the handing of years past. Australians want and need to understand this relationship better. And it cannot be brushed aside by the government with a simple, trust us, we know what we're doing. That approach no longer works in foreign policy. The relationship between the United States and China is the most significant in the world today, and its character will determine our region for decades to come. It is clear that the US and China now treat each other as strategic competitors, and the strategic competition in our region means we need to think carefully and engage actively to avoid becoming collateral. Great powers will do what great powers do, assert their interests. But the rest of us are not without our agency. And the choice is whether we are to be spectators to the competition between the United States and China or active players. Australia will only realise our objectives through a multipolar region. A multipolar region in which the US remains deeply and constructively engaged, in which China is a positive contributor, and in which the perspectives and contributions of smaller powers are respected and valued. Part of this imperative is the increasing assertiveness China has evinced under the leadership of President Xi. We've seen this act in active engagement in regional and international organisations and, and in initiatives like the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and the Belt and Road Initiative. We've seen it in the south and east of China seas, the Mekong region, the Indian Ocean, in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, and in the tightening environment inside China, sweeping national security laws, crackdown on civil society and human rights activists, and the mass detention of Uyghurs. In Australia, we see reports of Chinese Communist Party interference and stories of pressure on members of the Chinese Australian communities and university students. But having said all that, we should not reflexively and preemptively frame China only as a threat. We recognise that China has a right to develop and a right to a role in the region alongside other regional powers. We recognise that China's economic development has been to Australia's advantage and benefited the global economy and so too the millions of Chinese people who have been lifted out of poverty. But we also recognise China isn't a democracy, 
nor does the Chinese Communist Party share our commitment to the rule of law. Differences between our systems and values will inevitably affect the nature of our interactions. And they will and do affect the nature of China's behaviour and ambition in the region. Behaviours and ambitions which appear to be coming more difficult to shape. Although there continues to be convergence of interests, the divergences have become more apparent and more acute, due both to, Australia's in, uh, to, both, to, due both to Beijing's increasing assertiveness and greater awareness in Australia as to the implications of the CCP's behaviour and ambitions. So we must look at how best to engage effectively with China while always standing up for our values, our sovereignty and our democratic system. Let us not forget that without Labor and a handful of coalition backbenchers, Australia would now have an extradition treaty with China. Reflect upon that. If the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government had got its way, there would now be an extradition treaty with a government, a country whose government does not share our commitment to the rule of law, the very thing that has sparked the protests now enveloping Hong Kong. Australia has a tradition of a largely bipartisan approach to foreign policy. That does not mean uncritical support for all decisions by the government of the day. Rather, it means having a sensible, calm and mature discussion without seeking to exploit complexities for political advantage. But it also means out speaking where it is in the national interest to do so. Given the instincts of this Prime Minister, I anticipate speaking out will become more necessary. Those of you who have observed me in, my, in this portfolio over these last few years know I take no pleasure from this. And it is in this vein that I want to comment on Mr Morrison's handling of the China relationship. There have been two troubling examples in recent times. In handling the questions over a member of his class of 2019, Ms Gladys Liu, Scott Morrison came up with a political tactic of saying it was racist to ask for her to account for the inconsistencies in her public statements and actions. And he sought to bring all Australians of Chinese heritage into it, apparently speaking on our behalf. Now, many commentators, from Peter Harcher and Greg Sheridan, to China expert John Fitzgerald to Andrew Bolt, pointed out in doing so, Mr Morrison had done Beijing's work for it. As Professor Fitzgerald explains, the charge that legitimate Australian concerns about Chinese government behaviour are driven entirely by bigotry and racism is one of the talking points of the CCP Propaganda Bureau. And he reminds us of occasions, December 2017, March 2018 and June 2018, where the Chinese embassy responded to government decisions and media reports that were not pro-Beijing with accusations of racial prejudice and racial bigotry. Fitzgerald goes on, within China itself, Party media and establishment intellectuals echo these talking points on racism and bigotry and use the swear, smear word, the smear word, to belittle legitimate Australian concerns. So what did our Prime Minister say when seeking to defend Gladys Liu? Let me quote. There is 1.2 million Australians of Chinese heritage in this country. This has a very gr grubby undertone in terms of the smear that is being placed on Gladys Liu. And I think people should reflect carefully in the way they have sought to attack Gladys over this matter and the broader smear that I think is implied in that over one, more than a million Australians. This reckless handling was replicated in the way Mr Morrison, he, he announced he no longer considered China to be a developing country. Now, there are legitimate questions to be asked whether or not China should take on more global responsibilities commensurate with its size and its power. And there are legitimate concerns about whether the WTO remains fit for purpose and what reforms are needed to ensure it reflects current economic realities. But the Prime Minister declaring that China should be considered a newly developed country while in the United States, after attending a Trump rally, does nothing, nothing to further these reforms. The issue of China's status in the WTO or any multilateral arrangement must be dealt with in those organisations and through negotiation with other members. Worse though, Mr Morrison's pronouncement was easily construed as Australia tagging along behind the US administration's position. This gave unnecessary fuel to the Chinese government narrative that Australia just follows the US, that when we make decisions that China doesn't like on 5G or the South China Sea, for example, we do so only because we have been asked to by the United States. And we saw this in the, the official response to Mr Morrison's statement. 
I quote, the assertion of China being a newly developed economy is both one-sided and unfair, and it is basically an echo of what the US has claimed. This was further reinforced by the comment from visiting academic Chen Xiaochen, who asserted that, and I quote, in some cases, Australia was actually being a pawn for the US. Australia is, of course, entitled to state whatever we want, wherever we want. But on any issue, this should always be part of a considered and well thought out plan, not a political tactic. Australians expect Mr. Morrison to persuade, expected Mr. Morrison to persuade President Trump to protect our interests in how he deals with the trade war. And the reality is that Mr. Morrison's comments were mostly intended to distract from his failure to achieve anything much of substance with President Trump, especially on how he deals with Australia's interests in the trade war. On this point, it is far too early to be confident that the partial deal struck last week will lead to a resolution of the far bigger matters still under dispute, although we hope it does. And it is too early to be confident that these matters have been resolved in a way that sees Australian interests protected. It is important now for Mr Morrison to demonstrate that Australian farmers won't be worse off under the deal struck between the US and China. And distraction tactics are not en enough. Because after his visit with Mr Trump with nothing to show on trade, Scott Morrison threw out a new ball to chase, calling China newly developed. And it worked. Who noticed that he got nothing helpful on that trip from President Trump on the trade war? Now, all of this might be very slick and very clever, but our foreign policy community knows that it is not in our national interest, not in Australia's national interest, to play into China's narrative. And it knows that our national interest is not served when decisions are made for short-term political gain. But this is what Mr Morrison does, and it is part of an emerging pattern of behaviour. We saw this in his deployment of US-style populism in his recent Lowy speech, where he claimed Australia was being told to do what to do by global organisations. He said, and I quote, it does not serve our national interests when international institutions demand conformity rather than independent cooperation on global issues. He went on to say, we should avoid any reflex towards a negative globalism that coercively seeks to impose a mandate from an often ill-defined borderless global community and worse still, an unaccountable internationalist bureaucracy. And he said, there is a new variant of globalism that seeks to elevate global institutions above the authority of nation states to direct national policies. What does he actually mean? He knows full well that the commitments made by Australia, the agreements and conventions to which we are party have been voluntarily entered into. They have all been decisions made by governments of the day in our nation's interests, and sometimes in the shared interests of all nations. His rhetoric is reminiscent of the right-wing nationalism we are seeing in the United States and elsewhere, and we are better than this. We are better than this and our national interests are not this. There is a reason why successive governments, both Labor and Coalition, talked about the importance of global cooperation through multilateral organisations. Mr Morrison knows Australia is a trading nation and as a substantial power, but not a major power, relies on global cooperation. Our prosperity depends on it. He also knows, Mr Morrison also knows, that the nationalist agenda in the US is an anti-immigration agenda, but it is equally an anti-trade agenda. You can't be pro-free trade and anti-globalist. So we need to call out Mr Morrison's bluff on this. And even if he wishes to follow, seeks to follow President Trump in closing Australia to immigration, he can never close Australia to trade. The Prime Minister is simply trying to distract and divert now, there is no doubt Scott Morrison is the best political tactician in Australia right now. He's the master of the political manoeuvre, but he hasn't delivered anything of substance because that is not who he is. A year into his prime ministership, we now have some context to guide us. His first foray into, into international affairs was to try and change Australia's long-standing bipartisan position on Jerusalem and the Iran nuclear deal in order to chase votes in the Wentworth by-election. As some pointed out at the time, Australia's position is not ultimately decisive in the political landscape of the, of the Middle East. But having a credible, credible position on the Middle East, built on support for a two-state solution, is fundamental to being taken seriously in the international community. 
It is also important in managing key bilateral relationships like Indonesia, which was predictably, predictably furious about the Prime Minister's tactic. So is it enough to be a clever political tactician when key relationships with our nearest neighbours are at stake? Is it enough to play short-term political tactics on something so profoundly important as the integrity of our political system or the assertion of our national interest? Australia's Prime Minister needs to look beyond the next manoeuvre, stop undermining his Foreign Minister and Trade Minister and deliver and develop a serious long-term plan for Australia's engagement in the region and the world. A serious and long-term plan that can proactively navigate us through the strategic competition between the United States and China and manage this new phase in our relationship with a more assertive China. Given the dis disruption in the, in the world, it is easy to make the excuse that there is too much out of our control. Australia can only achieve so much. And it is true, we can't solve all the world's problems, but we do have to solve our own. We do have agency. But there is no plan. And if you need any confirmation of this, again, just look at the PM's recent speech to the Lowy Institute, a disturbingly lightweight speech for the Prime Minister of a third-term government, laying out no pathway on strategic competition, not one new idea or one solution. What it did do was ditch the one plan the government did have, Julie Bishop's foreign policy white paper, which championed multilateralism and the rules-based order as fundamental to our national interest. And Mr Morrison has no plan for dealing with this new phase in Australian, Australia's, relationships, Australia's relation with China. Let me be clear, and I will say this, Labor wants to engage on China in a bipartisan way. I say that again, Labor wants to engage on China in a bipartisan way. But the government has no such motivation. I've made repeated requests of the Foreign Minister that relevant agencies, including DFAT, the Office of National Intelligence, amongst others, provide detailed and comprehensive briefings for parliamentarians on Australia's relationship with China. We continue to believe this is the best approach, although the Minister has yet to reply. Labor is also establishing our own caucus processes for engagement across the breadth of the China discussion because we believe it is the job of all members of parliament to protect and advance the national interest. And it is regrettable that we do so without the government's participation. The national interest is best served by bipartisan approach to the relationship in both rhetoric and handling as much as actions and decisions. You see, as a country, we all need to get on the same page because how we collectively manage the relationship with China matters, and it matters because there are substantial and growing differences in the substance of the bilateral relationship. It is inevitable that Australia will make more decisions that China does not like. This means that the way the relationship is handled will become even more important. The realities of China and our region mean we can't just pretend China doesn't exist or wish China away despite what some commentators and strategic analysts appear to want. And that would be counterproductive even were it possible. As China remains important to Australia's prosperity. Australia has benefited from China's remarkable growth and will continue to benefit from a prosperous China. And China will be critical and is critical to the shape and character of our entire region. So in this next phase in the relationship, engagement remains in the best interests of Australia and of China. Engagement and cooperation are vital even within a context of difference, disagreement or competition. But the nature of that engagement needs to be redefined. Just as I have advocated for the need to define the boundaries in US-China strategic competition, so too we need to define the boundaries in our engagement with China. This will require asking and answering questions like those Professor Bates Gill has posed. In this more constrained atmosphere, what should the rules of engagement with China, what should be the rules of engagement with, with China to best realise Australian values and interests? Where are opportunities for engagement in this environment and where are the risks? Alan Gingell and others have spoken, spoken of small yards with high walls. These are sound approaches. Where it is necessary to place limitations around engagement, those boundaries should be as restricted as possible and as robust as necessary and the boundaries and terms of engagement will differ on different issues and in different sectors. On research collaboration, for example, rather than ruling out engagement across entire fields, 
Limitations such as export controls and visa checks could apply to a narrow set of the most sensitive defence-oriented technology, as China expert Dirk van der Klee recently proposed. While the government must provide leadership, this is not just a task or responsibility for government alone. All stakeholders, government, opposition, the foreign policy community, business, industry, need to work together to identify those opportunities for deeper engagement where our interests coincide and to manage differences constructively. And to that end, there is a particularly important role and responsibility for the media. Australian media has a responsibility to not only hold the government of the day to account, but to ensure they themselves don't unthinkingly or inadvertently reinforce China's tactics or narrative. As Fitzgerald warned, is, warns in his recent ASPE report, Mind Your Tongue, within Australia, mainstream media organisations amplify CCP claims of racism and bigotry through uncritical repetition. And this is vital even more so in the context of much of the Chinese language media landscape being owned and manipulated by the CCP. Australia's diversity and multiculturalism is an integral part of who we are. It is an integral part of our contemporary identity and it is one of our greatest strengths. And as we work together as a country to navigate the relationship, we need to include a wide range of Australian voices, including those from Australia's Chinese communities. And we must guard against racial fault lines from our past being allowed to resonate today. This would not only have consequences for our national cohesion and national identity, but also diminish our national power and influence. So in conclusion, I, I make these points. Leadership is essential to ensure Australia remains united as we work together as a country to navigate the challenges and opportunities in this period. We should be clear that Australian sovereignty is beyond politics and is never up for negotiation. We must not succumb to sacrificing the national interest for short-term political gain. I believe the national interest is best served by a bipartisan approach to international engagement. But Mr Morrison's motivations are not the national interests. They are short-term political interests. We've seen this now with his response to Gladys Liu, his statement about China's status, his anti-globalist low E speech and his decision on Jerusalem. His willingness to use reckless language and to take risky decisions for domestic political gain. I end on this point. I truly hope Mr Morrison changes this approach. I truly hope we can return to a constructive bipartisan approach to foreign affairs so we can act together in the national interest. But until he does, we all have a responsibility to call him out. Thank you. We've got time for one or possibly two questions. If you could keep your questions short, please. Over there? Right. Right, one there and one there if we've got time. So first over here. Many thanks. Uh, Mark Beeson, uh, Research Chair of the AIIA. Uh, I enjoyed your presentation very much and thanks for being so frank about the criticism of the Morrison government. But uh, some of the criticisms you make could equally be applied to the ALP perhaps because one of the issues that seems to be emerging is that uh, Morrison's repetition of a sort of Trumpian line about anti-globalization uh, is concerning, but is, has the ALP really got a substantial uh, alternative to offer, particularly when it comes to being taking a more independent approach to foreign policy and rather than simply uh, reflexively doing whatever it is the US seems to be doing at that time. The ALP has not got a great record on this either, perhaps. Oh, I, I just simply don't agree. I mean, I, I think you've got a Prime Minister who's walked away from decade, decades-long position about the importance of multilateralism. It is true in terms of foreign policy, Labor has probably had historically you know, a greater focus on multilateralism, on global cooperation and on the region than on bilateral um, uh, engagement uh, the, the, than, the, than the coalition, but I, I think we should understand the Lowy speech for what it is, which is uh, an articulation that is completely at odds with Julie Bishop's foreign policy white paper and decades of foreign policy from both governments of both political persuasion. And from, proceeding from the simple point that global cooperation is in Australia's interests. It supports Australian jobs. Uh, you can't be anti-globalist and be pro-free trade, but that's what the Prime Minister is. Uh, in terms of independence, I, I, what I would say to you is I would argue... I'm just going to put my water down. You know, 
We've been quite clear that there are times where uh, you know, the US alliance is beyond politics. It has long-standing bipartisan support, notwithstanding there might be disagreements from time to time between governments of the day or, uh, and particular administrations. That's historically a fact. Um, uh, we have been clear about making our view known on issues where both where we agree and also don't agree with the Trump administration. Uh, and you, you might recall, in fact, in, in relation to the, the very the tragic and violent events in northern Syria, uh, that I was uh, took a, a different approach to Mr Morrison and Senator Payne last week, uh, both calling on Turkey to desist, talking about the regional and global instability and humanitarian consequences of the decision, but also making the point that they don't wish to make, which is that this decision has been enabled by the decision of the Trump administration and a decision which has been criticised by Republicans such as Senator Lindsey Graham and also the former former US uh, general, in, uh, commander of, of general command, General Votel. So um, uh, I'm sorry, I'll have to disagree, agree to disagree. There's one down here too. Uh, thank you, Senator Wan. Uh, Andrew Ritchie, AIIA. Uh, it, it's top of a follow-on question from, from the one we just had, but given, given the um, uh, more isolationist uh, approach of the Trump administration in particular, and probably longer term of the US in general, and particularly in view of uh, the uh, uh, withdrawal from Syria last week and the, the um, leaving the Kurds alone. Should we perhaps be thinking of a more independent foreign policy and defence policy in Australia now? <laughs> well, I think there's a couple of issues conflated there. Um, yeah. uh, I, I think that... Um, well, first, the US alliances are key strategic alliance uh, and um, a cornerstone of Australia's um, a strategic uh, policy. So we, we don't resolve from that. Uh, I, I do think, and I made the decision last week and I have repeated it today, uh, that uh, where there are decisions made by an administration which uh, we don't um, believe are in the interests, global interests or Australia's interests, we should assert that. Uh, and uh, I certainly made the point yesterday, uh, last week in, in response to what is occurring in northern Syria, made the same point, as I said, that uh, a number of uh, others may have made in the US about the effect of the Trump administration's decision to withdraw in, for a range of reasons, including the compromising of the fight against Daesh, and I think that's been borne out in recent days. I'm happy to take one more, and if it could be a woman, because I have a view that there is, if there are three in a row, that there oh, we go. So we you are. always have to encourage it. You? <laughs> and then it will be bad because it will be a really hard question, I'll regret having <laughs> enabled it. <laughs> Here comes the mic. Hi, sorry. My name is Judy Gao. I come from Victoria Department of Transport. My question is regarding how should we, uh, I'm a new immigrant, Chinese Australian. My question is how should we voice ourselves to show, uh, to earn the respect, to have the social inclusion and the truly belongings here, to show others we are truly Australian. You don't have to prove anything to me. That's the first point I'd make. And I think that the, um, you know, we're, we're a country that has been built on and strengthened by waves of migration. Um, uh, and you know, every group of, every wave of migrant, every um, group of people who come this, to this country at different times uh, have made this country stronger. Uh, I think uh, you know, there are questions, all pe people are judged on what they do uh, people are judged on, on their behaviour, uh, not by their ethnicity. Uh, and what I regret about some of the debate, including, as I discussed, the way in which the Prime Minister used this, is that legitimate questions about an individual's behaviour uh, were used uh, to ground an allegation or an assertion of racism. But welcome, and you don't have to prove anything to me. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you Senator Wong.